Hey guys, Steve the Amateur Historian, and I wanted to bring to you something uh, that I forgot I even had. It was long lost in my mess of DVDs. I um, even have a podcast that I did that was kind of based on this, where I talked about uh, my life experience in high school vis-a-vis 9-11, uh, talks about going to war with Iraq, and this uh, video I have to bring to you was a locally presented uh, town hall meeting that took place in the theater at my high school during my junior year, literally a month, maybe two, I mean we're talking a couple months to maybe just a couple of weeks before we did officially invade Iraq. And it was a town hall hosted by Peter Jennings, who, I mean, a lot of people maybe don't necessarily know who he is today because he's been dead for several years, but Peter Jennings was like one of the top two or three major national news people in America. And he came all the way down to Milwaukee, Oregon to moderate this town hall with a bunch of kind of local people, you know, mixes of conservatives and liberals discussing whether or not we should take action against Iraq shortly before it actually happened. So it's kind of this this time capsule of remembering life when we actually weren't at least noticeably at war with somebody. So I thought I'd bring that to you guys. Uh, from my high school back in 2003, here's that town hall moderated by Peter Jennings. Good evening, I'm Natalie Marmion, live tonight in front of Rex Putnam High School in Milwaukee, Oregon. Tonight, inside the Fine Arts Building, a very important event. It's a special town hall meeting discussing our nation and Iraq. And leading tonight's meeting, ABC World News Tonight anchor Peter Jennings, who has just returned from Iraq. Now, joining him is our very own Steve Dunn and 600 KTU viewers. We're glad you're tuning in. It's sure to be an impressive event. Town hall begins now. Tonight, a special edition of K2's Town Hall, Iraq Countdown to War, hosted by ABC's Peter Jennings. Is the time to act in the coming weeks, or should weapons inspectors be given more time? Panelists and our audience take part in a fair and balanced discussion. Now, K2's Steve Dunn and Peter Jennings. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for being here tonight. I can tell you, I cannot beg 600 of my friends to come when I do town hall. But Mr. Jennings shows up tonight. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter Jennings. Thank you. <laughs> Eleanor, taking our time. I, I can tell you we have a lot of interesting things to talk about, particularly Iraq. But what else you want to talk about? That's what Peter is here for. First of all, uh, as we get to many of the questions, as we gather here tonight, the Northwest and the rest of the nation, obviously uh, divided on war. Just last month, as a matter of fact, many of you may remember, about 20,000 people marched through downtown Portland. It was a big deal. Their message, you can see on the video, don't go to war. Instead, they pushed for peace. But on the opposite side, support for the war seems to favor the majority. Our most recent exclusive K2 poll, taken just two days ago, of 500 people in the Portland area, finds 60 percent support U.S. military action against Iraq, 31 percent Oppose it. Thank you very much for being here. Peter, that's where you take over. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. Sit down. I'll get to you just a second ago. Uh, just while I've been flying here from New York today, a couple of pieces of news which may help us along. The Chief UN Weapons Inspector Hans Blix and Dr. Baradai, as you know, are in Iraq at the moment. Dr. Blix said today he saw signs of a change of heart from Baghdad over disarmament. Um, and the Iraqi officials have handed over to him documents on anthrax. VX, the nerve gas, and some missile development. However, Mr. Blix said they were still not happy with the Iraqi reaction to the UN request that they be allowed to fly U-2 flights on a permanent basis. And to quote Dr. Blix, he said today, we're not at all at the end of the road, but I, my job is to register nuances, and I think this was a nuance. We'll try to figure out what that means in just a minute. President Bush said today uh, in uh, West Virginia, uh, that it is clear Iraq is not disarming and is deceiving the Iraqi, the UN arms monitors. A top Iraqi official says Baghdad has given the names of more UN nuclear scientists. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, said today that world leaders should persistently seek a political solution. It's a view you've heard re reflected over the last couple of days by the Germans and by the French. So that's a little bit of the latest news. And now let me introduce you to a panel, uh, many of whom will be much more familiar to you than they were to me several hours ago, but I've already figured out they're all 
dying to talk about whatever it is you ask us. So let me start over there on my right, on your left, and introduce Steve Dunn, who is the main news anchor at KETU. Next to him is Major General Alexander Bergen, who has been the commanding officer of the Oregon National Guard since 1999. Lars Larson, who's probably more familiar on radio maybe than he is on television, the host of Portland's number one radio talk show on KXL Radio. Elizabeth First, former Oregon Congresswoman, a Democrat, currently directs the Institute for Tribal Government at the Hatfield School for Government. Fascinating subject. On my left and on your medium right, Democratic Congressman Brian Baird, who represents Southwest Washington. Steve Engelberg, one of the several journalists on this panel, a managing editor of The Oregonian, and the co-author of the best-selling stunning book, Germs, among other projects, and a Pulitzer Prize winner. You should all be, th thank you, stars. Very lucky that he's here in Oregon following his wife. Um, next to Steve, Dr. Catherine Thomason, the president of the board of the Oregon chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and last and certainly not least, Representative Jeff Krupp, who was a member of the, or a Republican member of the Oregon House of Representatives. I'm very pleased you're all here, and as I've told everybody so far, we are now at their mercy, and I believe you have the first question, sir. Thank you. For any panelist, I'd like to ask, in your estimation, has the Congress and the administration adequately considered that war with Iraq will intensify the anger, hatred, and hostility, and possibly fuel the flames of religious fanaticism against America. Could this lead to a long-term religious clash between Islam and Christianity, the Middle East against Western civilization? Well, you ask a lot of questions, all of them very pertinent to the present issue. I'm going to start with General Bergen and see if you have any thoughts about that, sir. Well, I, I don't think there's any doubt that the risk is higher uh, in our nation. As, as you see the Department of Homeland Security develop, it is, uh, and it's developing in the state of Oregon, it is something to look at. But I would say, and that's just a personal opinion, uh, I, don't, I don't think it'll go as far as, as a, a, a Muslim versus Christianity. It may be certain sects of a religion versus Christianity or against the free world. But yeah, the threats will be higher, but I think the government is also taking steps to mitigate the threat. And Jeff Krupp, do you think this is something about which the administration would be particularly concerned on the eve of war? I think it's really ancillary to the entire debate, to be honest with you, because I think we're already at that place. Uh, I think there are a group of individuals who view Christianity, the foundation of our great country, as absolutely, they abhor it. And they're committed to destroying our way of life. Now, that's certainly not all of the people in Islam by any, any means. But there are people that clearly, by the issues of September 11th, are after us. And I think that uh, at this point, I don't know that we can make the situation any worse with that group of people. Now, there are others, obviously, but with that group, I think they're already committed to our destruction. Steve Engelberg, you wrote a series, uh, which you won your Pulitzer for on Al-Qaeda. What do you think? Uh, I'd have to take some issue with that. I think if you look at the current situation in the Middle East, the Palestinians have ample reason to choose America as an enemy. And it's not a coincidence that we've not seen any Palestinian suicide bombings in the United States. One of the more significant things I think that's just happened is uh, Sheikh Yassin, the leader of Hamas, is now saying publicly, this war, as we see it, the war that's coming is a crusader war. We must support Iraq. In point of fact, Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein was hated by bin Laden for many, many years. Al-Qaeda really had, until very, very recently, no discernible ties uh, to Iraq. And uh, bin Laden spoke rather you know, dismissively of uh, uh, Saddam Hussein. So this is, a new, this is a new day we're coming to. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't do this. I just... Lawrence? But that begs the question. If the question is, by going to war against Saddam, that we'll somehow in, uh, engender some kind of additional enmity, and I would agree with Jeff, I don't know how we can make it worse than it already is. You've just made the case for why Osama bin Laden shouldn't care whether we do something to Saddam Hussein, because Osama bin Laden doesn't care about Saddam Hussein. So, you know, I, I don't know how much more some of those groups that truly do hate this country, its foundations and its freedoms, could hate us anymore. Is it your considered judgment it could not get any worse than it is now? Well, I, I, I don't think the people, the fanatics, who 
who believe that our way of life, I think, is corrosive to their culture, is, it w is, is, uh, is contaminating their culture, I don't think they could hate us anymore. Could they commit more acts of terror against us? Absolutely. Will they do it because we attack Saddam and not if we don't? I don't think that's, I, I agree, it's ridiculous. I was, I was just in Egypt and met with President Mubarak, and the gentleman raises a very good point. President Mubarak said you have to do two things should you proceed. One, everything possible to minimize civilian casualties. And two, you must not allow this to be portrayed as a war against Islam. And this notion that there is a group of people who are antithetical to Christian values contributes to that. Last week, President Cheney spoke at a National Political Conservative Action Conference where they had bumper stickers that said, no Muslims, no problem, and no terrorism. You cannot imagine how destructive that is in the Middle East. I was in Egypt. I was treated with great warmth by many, many people there. They said this, we are not opposed to Americans. We don't oppose American values. What we are concerned about is the possibility of civilian casualties, and they're concerned about how we deal with the Palestinian-Israel issue. And if we can reduce casualties, deal with the Palestinian-Israel issue in a more constructive way, be more involved, we'll be a lot better off. I have a feeling we're going to come back to this. Yes, sir. Hi, yes, I'm James Bell, and I'm a student journalist here at Rex Putnam. And I was wondering, why is the uh, United States so fixated on uh, having proof that there's, quote, weapons of mass destruction, when it's already been proven that Saddam Hussein uh, is a mass murderer? Shouldn't his uh, past experiences and possibility of future, um, shouldn't that uh, qualify for immediate action by the U.S. and uh, the U.N.? Elizabeth first, there's the question I think speaks to is Saddam Hussein, whatever his reputation, a strategic threat to the United States? Well, I don't think he is a, a strategic threat to the United States in this way. I think that the United States has always uh, abhorred the idea of first strike. And if we now decide that we are able to just say, well, so-and-so is a bad person, we want to get rid of them, and we're going to use first strike, we open up every other country in the world to decide the same thing. I think what you have to look at as a person growing up in Oregon is what is the real threat? The real threat to me is, for you as a young person growing up in Oregon, the economic threat. Do you wake up every morning and worry that Saddam Hussein is coming through the back door or do you worry that you're going to get a job? that there'll be a school that will be decent to are be Are you changing in. the subject, or are you saying that we... <laughs> no, I'm talking, I'm talking about threat. I think we always worry. We, we can create great threats. But you know, in this world, we always have to judge which threat is the greatest But, but why don't you, but maybe if you would, and maybe Steve as well, speak to the threat that concerns the young man at the moment, which is Saddam Hussein. And if you wish to add an economic component to that, mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that a country of this great reputation should go to war to get rid of one person. I really don't. If, I think if you can imagine the thousands of people, including children and women, who will die when we firebomb Baghdad, and we will. So, I, no, I don't think you go to war a country like this Steve? to yeah, get rid I, of one person. You're right, Elizabeth. I think it's a situation we all remember, of course, the Gulf War in 1991. A very, very difficult time, though it was a, a relatively quick war, uh, what, a couple of weeks. We still have that bad taste in our, our mouths from that war. And I think we as American people don't want to see that type of thing again. And we want it to be, let's make absolute positive sure we know what we're doing before we go in there. I agree with what you're saying, but I think as an American people, we want to be positive before we go in again. Yeah. Steve? I'm sorry, go ahead. I think that we should have gone to war many years ago against Adolf Hitler. I thought you Because we would not have murdered 23 million people in the world at that time. And that's my concern. If we allow this man, who may be not a threat today, but that photograph that Colin Powell showed the other day in the UN of that huge rocket test stand, clearly shows that Saddam Hussein is interested in long-range missile capability. Why does it clearly show that to you? 
Because you don't build those big rocket stands to test those engines unless you're going to punch a rocket across the world. Actually, I, I, I hate to take automatically the other side here. Journalists like to do from time to time. But the New York Times reports today that all the reporters were taken to that rocket stand yesterday to show that it was actually elongated like this to provide greater safety to the people who worked on the site and that the roof was put in. UN weapons inspectors seem to be quite uh, satisfied to protect it from the elements, not necessarily to hide it. I only raise that because they're sometimes reporting of a different nature, Steve. I'd like to go back to the question for a moment, because I think it's a very good question. I think we kind of drifted away from that. Why weapons of mass destruction? The administration's argument, you can take it or not as you wish, is that if Saddam Hussein has those weapons, and he has contacts with terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda, the risk that he will give those weapons to one of those groups and thus use it against us is foreseeable. And if we as a country can foresee that risk and don't act, what will the consequences be? Everybody said, wait a minute, how could you not have foreseen World Trade Center? That was known. Hijacking airplanes, that was known. You didn't connect the dots. We'll give you one. We as a people are not going to accept, I think, a second failure to connect the dots. And so that's why the WMD argument is one cornerstone and the link to Al-Qaeda is the other. I think that's the essence of the administration's argument in favor of this. You can take it as truth as not, but that's what, that's what their argument is. Catherine Thomas. And I think they haven't made a case. I don't think they've made a case at all. The case to go to war, according to international law by the UN Charter, and this rule was created because of Hitler, so that clear understanding, and Hitler could have been stopped earlier if we'd have had those earlier international laws that say, we have to prove imminent threat, or we have to prove global security risk. It hasn't been made. The case has not been made. 85 to 90 percent of any weapons of mass destruction have been taken out of that country by the inspectors. The inspectors were instructed to leave on the basis of the U.S., unlike what President Bush has been saying. And they've been allowed back Peter in. Start, Peter started tonight by saying they've just admitted they have more weapons that they're not supposed to have under the agreement. And, I mean, even somebody like Ted Kennedy wrote Friday afternoon in, a, in, a, in an opinion in the Boston Globe, Saddam is dangerous, he must be disarmed, and he does have weapons. Now, that's somebody from the political left saying, this guy's dangerous, he's got the weapons, he has to be disarmed. And you're saying the case hasn't been made. I would say the I The case has not been made that there's imminent threat to the country of the United States or a global security risk. The fact that he's allowed the inspectors back in, the fact that he's allowing them unforeseen and, and amazing amounts of opening to come into the country and to take care of these things, certainly under pressure, and I'm not, I'm not defending Saddam Hussein, but the fact that the reason we have international laws is so that all countries must abide by them. And if the U.S. decides to place themselves above international law, then that opens up any other country to do the same. We're a sovereign can nation. I just, can I just maybe rephrase the question? No, I take it back. I won't rephrase the question. Madam, <laughs> you have the question. <laughs> my name is Ellen Block, and I'm from Hillsboro. And my question tonight is, if diplomacy is considered the right response to North Korea's recent threats, why is war considered the right response to Iraq? Lars? Because there's no other way to disarm this man. How do you he is know not that? going to disarm himself. How do you know that? Uh, I know that because the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Psychologists will tell you that. I, I don't think any person in this auditorium will tell you that the best predictor of General Bergen's future behavior is his past behavior. Saddam Hussein has been dangerous. He's shown himself to be aggressive toward his neighbors. He's fired ballistic missiles at, I think, four different countries. He's used poison gas on his own people. He continues to Lars, not... Lars, he has, uh, forgive me, let uh, General Bergen have a chance at this, but by pointing out to you first, he hasn't done anything in 12 years. <laughs> he, conti he continues to obtain weapons that he's not supposed to have. General Bergen. I think the, what I would say is, is that on military action actually is part of diplomacy. It, it's historically a perspective of you do certain things, but military action is always in the background as an option, and it is maybe the final option, mm -hmm. diplomacy, but that's what we elect our, our officials and our national command authority, uh, the people that are appointed to do, is to try to make the best uh, objective uh, input for every nation that they're dealing with, North Korea, Iraq, those aren't the only two nations we are dealing with diplomatically on varying levels. General Bergen, a number of very senior military officers in the country, both in the service and out, are anxious about us attacking <coughs> Iraq. What do they know that we don't know? 
Well, I can tell you what any soldier knows is uh, that, that war is not the option that they want to do first. And it just comes from a perspective of having been there and knowing all of the ramifications of, of an armed conflict. It isn't that they don't think we're capable of executing this mission, because we fully are. But I think they're worried, not worried necessarily, but they're concerned about soldiers, about collateral damage, about citizens and civilians, and ultimately what the end state will be. One of the things I think we're hearing a little bit in this debate and others now is that, is that there's an urgency to go to war in some segment of the civilian community. As a soldier, do you think that we civilians are sometimes a little too eager to go and have you do our business for us? Not, not necessarily. I, I believe totally what we've established in this nation. Our founding fathers were probably more genius than we know. But, but just establishing civilian control of the military, our commander in chief is not a military person. He, he or she may have served in the military. The commander in chief of the state of Oregon for the Oregon Guard is our governor. And therein lies maybe some of the problems with uh, arguments and understanding of everything that goes on. But it is absolute genius. And the nations that have not done that have failed. We'll continue this discussion. We'll be right back. He didn't think he was coming back. A soldier killed in battle, his daughter not yet born. And he wanted a girl. Here I am. Monday at 5, the answer is a daughter. Well, nobody's told me, but I think we're back. Um, <laughs> you're very generous. I mean, so far, we haven't said enough feet wrong <laughs> up here yet. Yes, ma'am. Michelle Ader, what can we expect in the form of retaliation following an attack of Iraq by the U.S.? What do you mean by retaliation? Do you have anything specific in mind? Um, are, are we to expect some that, kind of That somebody attack might of... attack Portland? Yes. That's a very good question. Um, who wants to try that? Steve, you should probably try that, if I may. You've had some experience with this. Well, you know, these never trust a picture from a journalist. Uh, they're always wrong. But um, I think let's go back to a couple of things that were predicted back in 1990. It's interesting. The CIA was asked in 1990, will Saddam Hussein use weapons of mass destruction? They said, probably not, unless he feels a regime change is threatened. They reiterated that opinion four months ago. Now. Does he have the capability to do something in Portland or anywhere else in the United States? Hard to say. If he has the connections to Al-Qaeda that are alleged, or to other terrorist organizations, obviously his opportunities go up. Would that be an end game strategy that he could use? Certainly. And I think that's why you're seeing these FBI threat warnings rising up. But the history of Al-Qaeda is such that generally they will tend to hit where you don't expect when they don't expect. So I wouldn't necessarily guarantee that the first day of the war you're going to see anything, or even the first week. I mean, it may be many months, it may be never. Not a very satisfying answer, is it? It's interesting, though, that for, for Steve Engelberg and for me, and also for Steve Dunn, we all have to transmit these alert warnings. And when uh, Attorney General Ashcroft came out this week again and said they'd raise it up again, we all thought to ourselves, what are they hearing? Because they're not going to tell us what they're hearing, except in very general terms. But any of us who've ever covered terrorism anywhere, I think, feel, Steve, don't you? that the last thing we're ever going to get is a terrorist attack on the weekend they tell us it's going to happen. Oh, absolutely. I just, I just an instinct, I mean, I've covered terrorism in several continents and it just never happens when you, who would have thought they would have hit Mombasa? Right. I think you, Peter, I think you want to also expand the time frame. The, the notion that, that if we attack, will we have a counterattack or a terrorist attack immediately? We need to be aware that if we occupy that region, if there are heavy casualties, if in some way this does get uh, portrayed as an Islam versus Christianity, East versus West, then the long-term perspective, I mean, there are nations in this world that have been dealing with terrorism for decades and decades and decades, and we need to be cognizant of that. The, the, the gentleman earlier who said uh, Saddam Hussein's a bad man, everybody up here agrees Saddam Hussein's a bad man. He's a horrific man, he's a dictator, he's killed a lot of people. The question before us is, what's the best policy to secure the safety of our people and the long-term well-being of that region and of, and of our people? And there are other options. The mere fact that Saddam Hussein is an evil man, which he is, and we need to, as Congress and as citizens, let him have no illusion. In a democratic republic, we disagree on the best strategy. 
But if we launch the attack, we will unite as a nation and support our troops. But that doesn't necessarily mean that now is the time to attack and that we've exhausted all options or that we may not have a better option that would guarantee long term. I, I don't think we necessarily automatically have to go from Democrats to Republicans here. But, Jeff, do you agree? <laughs> well, I, I frankly way, do, a question. I, think I, I do agree in, in, in partially with what Brian's uh, articulated there. I think that ultimately, if there's a way that Saddam Hussein can be removed from power, and I believe regime change should be affected over there, because I believe the Iraqi people need to taste freedom. And I think that that's... And you do think that's an American role. We should, we should change the regime in Iraq on their behalf. And, and having done that, should we then maybe change it in Saudi Arabia to make it more democratic? Well, that's clearly an issue that the Saudis are very concerned about, as most of the Arab dictatorial nations are. Is that a role for America? Yeah. Okay. It is, because we spilled a lot of blood in this country to argue that very issue uh, in 19, or 1776 when we began this country. So, yeah, I think it is a role for us to share with the world how wonderful freedom is. Elizabeth, do you want to argue the other well, side of that? Well, I don't think it's a very free thing to go to other peoples and tell them that we know best for them. And I want to return to this well, lady's stay, question. Stay, stay. Well, I, I, just want, <laughs> I just want to... You make it quick? I, I make it very quick. I travel a great deal. I am not going to Europe this year in March mm. because I do not want to be an American carrier trundling down the airport. I think we are victims then. I think we are targets. I think we as Americans will be in great jeopardy, in great jeopardy worldwide. I think we already are. Well, but if, if we already true. are. Hold it, Lars. If true, if that's true, if we're already in great jeopardy by just being who we are, we haven't attacked yet, I know we've threatened, then doesn't that suggest that that is somebody that we need to go and address, even though he's not in our backyard? Uh, if, if, if somebody in your neighborhood presented a threat to the neighborhood, but he hasn't actually shot anyone yet, he hasn't actually done any Kim, bad things. Kim, Kim Jong-il next? Uh, maybe. And maybe by doing this, we send a message to every other nation that seeks to be a danger to not only its neighbors, but the rest of the world, that you can't continue to do this. this the world won't tolerate it. To, to further, further, to further answer your, your question, I, and then we're going to let you sit down, I promise you, but just to, just to say we've talked about retaliation. I'm going to keep her there all night. I don't blame you. Just, is a lot of it we just don't know. All of this is so new to us. 9-11 was new to all of us, and it was new to you as well. And we, from the media standpoint, just don't, didn't know how to cover it. We hadn't done it before. And now every, as Peter says, every red alert, every orange alert is so new to us. So when we talk about retaliation, we just simply don't know. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my name is Mark Schreiber. Welcome to Portland, Mr. Jennings. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my question is, is It isn't recently... how you look, it's just that my eyes are lousy. Okay. <laughs> Uh, recently watching uh, CNN, I had noticed that they had said that Saddam uh, Hussein, if, he, if the United States had attacked Iraq, that he would attack us with chemical warfare. And I was wondering how does this contradiction go if he's saying he does not have any chemical warfare or mass destruction weapons, how is it then being broadcasted on other networks that he does? Well, I think what uh, anybody can take this up as well, but I think they may have been referring on CNN to the Secretary of State's testimony at the Security Council the other day, where Mr. Powell said that, among other things, that the Iraqis might have long-distance unmanned vehicles, unmanned airborne vehicles, these drones, so to speak. And if I recall correctly, he said at one point, think how horrible that would be off the coast of the United States. I, I don't know of any intelligence, and I'm not sure that anybody else, Steve, actually can speak to this. I know, I know of no intelligence which suggests at the moment that he has either a long distance capacity to hit the United States or, quite frankly, that he has any intentions. I just don't know the answer to the second part of it. Anybody else in this? No. I think the theory is that not that he has a delivery vehicle, right. but that he might try to bring it in. I mean, the big risk for us, for most of these countries, is not an ICBM or something of that sort. It would be some covert bringing it in through a container ship or something like that. The whole notion that we're going to block and protect ourselves with that ballistic missile shield is ludicrous. People ABC's Brian Ross followed, followed a, uh, a container of, uh, how do you, what's the actual word, Steve? Um, not nuclear material, but um, radioactive yeah. material all the way from Turkey to New York Harbor uh, recently, and it was stunning. And the customs people got absolutely bananas when we told them actually what we'd done. And we'd actually asked their permission to cooperate, and they didn't, nobody caught it all the way through. It was quite Peter, Peter. scary. Yes, sir. 
Uh, I'm Mark Binky from Portland, Oregon. Uh, first off, I want to say I support going to war. I think Saddam needs to be stopped. I think his past record has proved that he supports terrorist organizations, and that alone should be enough to stop the man. Uh, my question has to concern to do with the draft. Has the draft been considered? Uh, is the government looking at it all, all at uh, reinstating the civil or uh, the uh, selective service system? And if so, would there be reform in it? And would it be a fair draft this time than the last time we had one in Vietnam, where that favored uh, the rich and the war turned into a, a war of the poor and uneducated? General Bergen, uh, take the last question first. There's never been a fair draft. Uh, huh, historically, uh, all the way back to the Revolutionary War. Uh, yes, it's been considered, and, and probably a congressman can talk about that. Do I think it got a high probability? No, I don't. Uh, if the sizes of our forces and the technical requirements of our forces uh, would dictate that, uh, barring a World War III uh, global conflict, uh, that the military is, or that the, that we will not reinstitute a draft. But there is a selective service system, and there is a requirement to register. My son has just signed up for the selective service on time, thank goodness. Charlie um, But you're trying to point out, I think, that the Army is very specialized now, and that a general draft isn't actually much good to you in the military. No, well, personally, I think it's still good. You want my personal opinion? I think some type of service to this nation, state or nation, uh, would, would be beneficial, not necessarily military, mm -hmm. service of some kind. Uh, most, most, most of our free world does that. Congressman Barrett, this, this was Militarily, it. no, I'm sorry. I agree. My I agree. apologies. This was introduced by two Democratic congressmen, both of them members of the Black uh, Democratic Caucus, because they wanted to point out that the war would be driven home, or the possibility would be driven warm, more effectively to Americans if they had sons or daughters who were obliged to serve. Exactly. Charlie Rangel from New York introduced right. a, a resolution to uh, reinstate the draft for precisely that reason. And his intent, surely the general race is a good point. We haven't had a fair draft ever, but uh, Mr. Rangel's purpose is that there is a disproportionate number of African Americans and minorities serving in the, in the armed services. Now, it turns out perhaps on the front lines that proportion may be somewhat different, but nevertheless, the point is it's a lot easier to send somebody else's kid into harm's way than to send your own kid into Many home. thanks. Next question. Yes, sir. My name is Chad, and I'm from Beaverton, Oregon. Um, if we do go to war, will this turn into a war like it was when we first went to war with Iraq? You mean, do you think this war might be similar to the Gulf War 12 years ago, which was to evict Saddam Hussein from Kuwait? Yes. Uh, well, um, Dr. Thomason, other than the general, you're as good a military analyst as we have here. Well, the um, British affiliate of the Physicians for Social Responsibility put out a report uh, about a month ago talking about what the effects of the previous Gulf War were and what the predictions are for the future. The, predict the actual fact of the war itself is that the number of dead was 142 to 200,000 individuals. Subsequent to that, because we knocked out the entire electricity system of the entire country deliberately, that the number of dead are 1.2 million, half of which were children. Now, what will happen in the next war? The same thing will occur. They will attack the electrical system, which knocks out the entire water purification system. They will attack um, they attack the Ministry of Health. They, the, the infrastructure is totally attacked, leading to many, many, many civilian deaths and woundings. Mm -hmm. Now, what they're doing now is that they have uh, forces in the north, which is pretty much autonomous in the area where the Kurds are. There is, um, there will have to do incredible amounts of air strafing, according to the projections. The number of our military losses from the first Gulf War was only 400 deaths that occurred, and about 500 were wounded. Mm. What will happen this time, however, if they actually allow, have to uh, have ground troops, which you have to do to take out a government, will be to strafe all the way through to Baghdad, a city of 5 million people. I wasn't going to stop you until you said they had to that. strafe all the way through to Baghdad. And I'm not, sure, also, that, uh, I'm not sure that's true, <laughs> Steve. I mean, in, in fairness to quote a friend of mine in the military I mean no no plan uh, survives contact with reality I don't think we know what's going to happen Precisely. I mean the fact of the matter is that I was in Washington when everybody said there is no way that bombing Yugoslavia will get Slobodan Milosevic to change any minds and there was not a single ground troop that ever went into Serbia and one day 
he did change his mind. Uh, the predictions about Afghanistan, you may remember when the American troops were going to Afghanistan, there were people who wrote up ed pieces that said, well, the British were there for centuries, they never did anything right, the Russians were bled for 10 years, we'll, 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 it's a quagmire, it's Vietnam. And again, no, ground, no regular troops, uh, hardly anybody, and a bunch of air action. So I think one wants to be very careful making clear predictions about military action. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know whether the Iraqi army will even fight. General, what, what do you think? No, that's true, and the campaign plan won't be the same for sure. Number one, he learned, and number two, we have a different launching base, but I can tell you air, air superiority will happen. There will be no uh, anti-air missiles left, nor the capability to do that. Probably aren't, any, probably aren't any left at the moment, I think, after oh, the some, southern and northern fly zones. Some. There's some. They're, they're yeah. lighting our, our yeah. troops up every day. Uh, our our F-15s have actually flown the no-fly zone twice. They get lit up every time they fly. You're talking about the Oregon Regardless, Air yeah, there will be... It'll be significant, and there, there will be infrastructure damage because that's how you protect your force, and that's how you ultimately conclude the war more rapidly. Or the, the administration. Yeah. We said, have one more break to take, Congressman. I apologize. We'll be right back. Welcome back, and thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Make it feel like it's a game show here. <laughs> <laughs> in case you've never been in the audience, they may. Anyway, um, welcome back. I think we'll see if we can get in, in some more questions, but very quickly, Neil Kenny Geyer, the chief executive officer of Mercy Corps, pointed out something we should all remember, that war just simply exacerbates the situation, and that while we don't know in Iraq what's going to happen in the long run, whatever the circumstances, however hard the U.S. military tries to avoid the civilian uh, community, and we hear it very often from the senior command these days about how intent they are not to harm the civilian establishment, that war exacerbates civilian crisis, no question, even if in the short run. Did I get that right, sir? Thanks. Yes, sir, you have the next question. Jerzy Gedwine from Portland. Before I ask a question, I want you to know that I am looking at it from different perspective. I was born in Poland. I am now a citizen of the U.S. My family, 75% of them, did not survive World War II because there were strong diplomatic attempts made to pacify Hitler. France was very much for diplomatic solution. Uh, that reminds me to stand now. You might know that Poland lost 7 million people. Mm -hmm. Poland now gives unqualified support to American position. And I hate to do this to you, sir, but what's your question? My question is, what do you think about the people of Iraq? How the war would affect them? How do they feel like? And you were there. Because I guess they might want to be liberated. We are not going to liberate them, but that might be a silver lining for them. After the war, my parents and their friends were praying for World War III. We knew we had not a good chance of surviving it, but this was the only way to get out from Russian occupation. We lost a quarter of a million people working underground and fighting the Russians and praying for the Americans to come. Very good point. Um, I don't know that any of us can answer with any authority about how the Iraqi people feel. I guess I'm the most recent person there. And I've been going off and on for 25 years, so I'll answer very briefly that we don't really know how we feel. But I think going into all of the U.S. planning at the moment, General, is some consideration that those who've lived under the Ba'athist regime for almost three decades are going to feel a sense of liberation. And while there appears to be some concern about the U.S. penetrating deep into the Arab heartland with a military force, um, it's impossible to get Iraqis to tell you what's on their mind today. It just isn't worth it from their point of view, unless somebody is listening. But I think there is this feeling that after a long period of time under the heel of this man that the U.S. at first will be welcome. So as we were reminding ourselves earlier, when the, when the Israelis went into Lebanon in 1981, they were welcomed with flowers, and the same people were throwing grenades at them less than a year later. So it's a very tough call. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Will Seaman. I'm with the Portland Peaceful Response Coalition, which is one of the over 140 groups that organized the peace march that had 
like 25,000 people on the street here in Portland. I want to ask about this question of support. We opened the show with a poll indicating that 60% of Americans support the war, 30% oppose. I think one of the lessons um, that came out of the Vietnam War was that if you are going to take your country into war, you genuinely need to, first of all, communicate those, the goals of that war clearly and have the uh, American public, in this case, understand and agree with them. And I think uh, if you look out into the world, certainly, the numbers are 80, 90 percent against the United States. Mr. Siemens, and if I, there are, are Mr. Siemens 30... I apologize. I apologize. I want to get a lot of questions in front of you. Do you have a question? Yes. If, if there are 30 percent of the country think this is really about oil, then how, how can we put our servicemen and women into a situation, into a conflict as controversial as that today? Lawrence. I don't think it's, uh, I think that the American public has been communicated to, and it shows in the polls, that there's been endless discussion. They've had the opportunity to read and see and hear a lot of opinion from both sides and a lot of hard data, especially the presentation by Secretary Powell, that really laid it right out. And I, and I think that some of the people are forgetting that you have to look downstream. Let's take the French solution, triple the number of inspectors. Let's just contain him. But the things we can agree on is that he does have the weapons, he is antagonistic toward us, and that if he had the weapons and the ability to deliver them, he would hurt us. If he, and so do you want to wait until he has the ability to hurt the United States, even if he delivers it through some uh, other terrorist? Elizabeth, Elizabeth, first, as you get deeper into the polls and they get more complicated, it's not quite that simple, is it? No, it's not. And I also think, and I have to go back to this issue, I don't think the American people have been told what this war will cost. I don't think they know that we will have to be there for years. I don't think they know that this enormous budget does not even contain a dollar for this war. So economics, that's what we need. American people need to know it's either this or that. A war is not free. A Jeff, war is not free. Jeff Krupp. This war is not about dollars and it is not about petroleum. It's about that man who's standing here from Poland. It's about World War II. That's what it's about. Because you can't measure the cost of human life. That's why going to war should be our last option. This is not about money. This, we ought to be concentrating define, on the fact that these people are enslaved over there. And I find it ironic define that people last here... Define last option. It must last be option. our last option, you said. Define that in this context. I think we should give every opportunity to work out a reasonable compromise, every opportunity through diplomacy, through every reasonable opportunity. The Iraqi people, I don't think it will happen, but for them to overthrow Saddam Hussein on their own, which would be the most poignant in my view, failing that, we go forward. But the, you would give the UN weapons inspectors more time then? A bit more. I think, after all, sooner or later, Saddam is a very smart man, and he will continue to do the rope-a-dope, as it's been called. And I think today was a perfect example of that. I think we'll see more of it. Interesting. Next question. Hi, I'm Jason Croning, and I'm a senior here at Rex Putnam High School. My question is maybe a question for the Major General. How are our troops prepared to handle the chemical warfare and other weapons that Saddam may throw at themselves? Well, they go through, uh, it's an intensive amount of training, and they're doing it right now. They'll do it 24 hours a day now until any action occurs, and that's exactly what we did in the first uh, in Desert Storm. It's just a constant training. It's an awareness issue, and believe me, it's, uh, it's arduous at best. Break it down a bit, General. Uh, for an infantryman uh, walking across uh, Iraq, it's tough. For a guy in a tank or an armored personnel carrier, right. he's a lot safer. Sure, they have a, a, a self-sealing system in there and it exhausts everything out and keeps air in. Uh, but they're still at risk. They still have to get out sooner or later and, and ultimately you can't stay in an armored or track vehicle. And ultimately you do have to crawl out of it. And there. one guy is always asked to take off his chemical yes. biological suit before After, the others. He's like the canary in the mine. After a number of tests though. Uh, the, there's a number of field tests that you perform uh, on, uh, on a chemical suspected chemical battlefield, biological or chemical. But don't you kid don't yourself. You don't unmask until then. Don't yes, kid sir. yourself. You Sorry. don't want to stay on this because it matters. We have been through a number of briefings, some of which are confidential. I will tell you that, and the general knows better than I, but fighting a chemical or biological war, especially in the desert, is tremendously difficult. We've never done it before, and it will be extraordinarily difficult. Temperatures inside those suits will be high. 
There are a number of suits that may be permeable because of a faulty manufacturing uh, de defect that we don't know where they are. And when we say we've informed the American people about war, we've informed them about war light. We haven't talked seriously about casualties. There's been no public estimate of U.S. troop or civilian casualties, and we have not included a single penny, as Elizabeth said, in the cost. Steve it's knows a lot. Steve knows a lot about this. Yes, Steve. Well, I'd like to throw out one other thing. We mentioned chemicals here. Uh, while it is true that nobody has linked Iraq to the uh, anthrax letters, it is quite clear that they have the technological ability to make that anthrax. We know that. The inspectors know that. Now, if they are able to produce large quantities of it, and no one knows what's gone, in, 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 gone on inside these rail cars, uh, that would present an even deeper challenge. The chemical suits that we're talking about, the breathing apparatus, are not real good in the face of anthrax. There were casualty estimates done before the Gulf War, worst case scenarios, if Saddam got one airplane within sight using liquid anthrax, and they went over 100,000. So, you know, this is a very serious business. It's a very serious question. The military does train for it, but I don't think we should kid ourselves. We are, we are taking the anthrax inoculations, though, and, and the people that are deploying right now, even out of the state of Oregon, it's required for, I've, I've had my series. I'm pretty much covered, and it doesn't cover you from all strains. Right. That's and true, and but we, do not yet have a we don't know what he's force. developing. Yes, sir. Good evening. I have one question regarding oil again. Um, how much influence do oil companies have in the Bush administration's decision to go to war, yeah. and who will stand to profit? Thank you. Lars. I don't think this is about oil, and I think the proof is that during all... Well, I'm, I'm just going to tell you the facts. I've done as much reading on this as I can, and the fact is is that uh, oil stocks have actually been down with all the, all the talk and, uh, of war, and that I don't think in the long run it, it is an issue. We do use oil in this country, and we do import it. Do you think that if we stopped imported all, all foreign oil, that the Islamic fundamentals would stop hating us? Do you think that Saddam Hussein would stop chafing under the restrictions we've put him under? He clearly does not want to be contained. That's why he lights up the general's planes when they fly over and tries to shoot them down. But if he ever gets the capability, and if we give well, him enough off, time, you're, he will. You're off oil in a hurry. Yeah. Who else would like to talk it's about... It's not about oil. <laughs> um, there is a deep... You, you, Lars, you can't deny the fact there's a deep feeling in, in much of the Middle East, and including in Iraq, that we're going there after their oil. But where do we benefit? I mean, I, I don't see how we benefit if well, Saddam... There are people in the administration will indeed tell you that if we capture Iraq, we democratize well, Iraq, that the Iraqi oil prices will contribute to stabilization in the world. Uh, yes, they will. So that's about oil. Well, that's about, about stabilizing prices. But... No. No, but, but you're missing the point. It stabilizes prices, and what does it do for the Iraqi people? We willingly buy what they willingly pump out of their ground and sell to us. And if Saddam wasn't there spending money on palaces and the military, the money under a reasonable government might be spent on the people. Next question. Yes, um, my name is Robert. I'm from Vancouver, Washington, one of Brian's constituents. And I just have to say... Does that make you happy, sir? <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to check. <laughs> and I'd just like to say that I've been following this debate that's been going on in, in Washington about why we should be going to war, and I've been listening to all you gentlemen and ladies um, this, this afternoon. And I must say that I have never heard a weaker argument for the fact of going to war, uh, certainly in my lifetime or even throughout recent history. I hear a lot of what ifs and what fors, and if Saddam has this, he could use that kind of argument. But my question is actually regarding North Korea, which to me appears to be a much more imminent threat. We do know that he is likely to be very close to developing atomic weapons if he doesn't already have them. We do know that he does export his weapons to rogue nations like Iran and Libya. And um, I'm sure that if um, a, a terrorist group comes up with enough cash, he probably wouldn't hesitate to, um, to distribute that. So my question is, why is the current administration downplaying the, um, the imminent threat from North Korea, and they seem to be obsessively focused on right. Iraq? Steve Engelberg, you're most recently from the heartland of the administration, Washington. Well, uh, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, the artillery range from the North, North Korea to Seoul is such that in the first hour of the war, Seoul is destroyed. Uh, roughly, General, correct? You're yes. Right. So that um, there are practical problems. I actually agree with you that if you drew this up on a blackboard and you ask any national security expert circa 1995, which is the more eminent threat? The one you outline is clearly more eminent. North Korea has absolutely been a proliferator. They have sold this stuff all over the world and they'll sell more of it because they need the money. Now I think 
My guess is that if you asked, if you had Dick Cheney here and you could give him truth serum, what he'd tell you is, well, honestly, they're next. I think that this stuff about diplomacy is to hold that problem at bay until they find a military solution or a d diplomatic solution backed by a military threat. I don't think they, this administration is going to leave this alone. I don't believe it. I think we're going to leave it there, too. It's very complicated, very good point. We'll be right back after one last message. Monday at 11 on K2 Nightcast. Under the Morrison Bridge. Welcome back. We're moving through this hour pretty quickly. You, sir, have the next question. Hi, my name is Josh Whitney Wise. I'm a student here at Rex Putnam. My question is, will the U.S. Be able, be able to effectively fight a war with Iraq without full U.N. support? And if so, will they be, be able to maintain a stable state in Iraq? Very good question. Uh, Congressman Baird. Quickly. My favorite. Uh, the more international cooperation we have, the safer our troops will be, the less the international ramifications. That's why I believe if we can keep the weapons inspectors for a protracted time, we benefit. Should Saddam reject the weapons inspectors, at that point we'd have strong international support to go in, and I would strongly favor a quick and speedy and accurate counterattack. The longer we can last, the better. Well, I partially agree, again, with the good congressman. Uh, you can only wait so long. The reality is, and General Bergen knows this, because he's been in combat in a very uh, hot place. Uh, Gentleman asked, can we go it alone? Yeah, we can go it alone. Uh, we have a lot of countries with us right now, so we don't necessarily need the UN support uh, to make this uh, happen. I think Brian's right. The more we get, the better off we are. Steve Dunn. I think we need the support uh, of more countries than you. We can't go it alone. I don't feel that we can. I think it's a situation where once we go in there and, and people start dying, we're going to need support of, of other countries. We truly will. Um, it, it scares me to death to go in alone, to be honest with you. But it's looking more and more that way as we report to you on a nightly basis that so many countries are backing away. Yes, ma'am. My name is Renee Gundolf. I'm a student at Portland State University. And my question is very different than everyone else's. Um, in regards to the agenda setting theory and communications, how do times of war influence how you report the news? Yeah, we spent a whole hour on that. Um, <laughs> it's going to be very difficult for you. I'm going to turn this over to Steve, who's the managing editor of a newspaper that looms large in your life when war comes along. And um, it's very difficult. As we look back at the Gulf War and as we look back at Vietnam, it was totally different. Vietnam was easy compared to the Gulf War. We didn't see very much of the Gulf War. It was a calculated decision by the administration not to let the press see what was going on. In fact, we were reminiscing earlier, Steve, that at the time of the Gulf War, we never saw a single dead person on either side. And my recollection is that all the televised smart bombs you saw night after night after night coming from the Pentagon represented, as it turned out, only about 6% of the weapons that were actually used. Most of them were dumb, dumb bombs, dumb bombs, gravity bombs dropped by B-52s. What do you think it's going to be like? I think it'll be an enormous challenge. And I, I think that we will probably not get it all right the first time. Um, you know, if you look at the history of all these wars, all these conflicts, you know, the, the, the cliche that you know, truth is the first casualty of every war. And it's not that the military is lying, it's that war is very confusing. It's very hard to see the pattern. I don't think we have the full story yet of what happened in Afghanistan, for example, a relatively you know, limited conflict. Um, I can assure you we'll be doing our very best at the Oregonian to try and sort it out, but we're many miles away, and I think it will be years if this war goes forward before we really know what happened. The foregoing was a paid political announcement uh, <laughs> on behalf of the Oregonian, and I now hear in my ear it is also uh, the end of our time. I, I must say just very quickly to all of you, I've done this in several places around the country. I always learn something, and so I thank you all very much for participating in this and teaching me something, but I don't think I've been at a panel that's been quite so vigorous, <laughs> <laughs> which I hope was very good for you. Thank you very much for joining us.